Welcome to today's webcast on some of the latest technologies and design approaches for software-defined radio. I'm John Keller, Chief Editor of Military and Aerospace Electronics. Today's presentation, New Technologies to Transform Software Radio Architectures, is by Roger Hosking, Vice President of Pentec Incorporated in Upper Saddle River, New Jersey, a specialist in software-defined radio and demanding digital signal processing. Our, process, our sponsors are Pentec and National Instruments Corp. of Austin, Texas. Systems engineers today are using several new technologies to transform software radio architectures to overcome tough performance and cost challenges. Some of these include higher bandwidth data converters, gigabit serial data interfaces, wideband optical system links, digital RF packet standards, new FPGA IP protocols, and graphically oriented design tools. By weighing the advantages and trade-offs of each technology, engineers can select the best design strategy for each system. Before we begin, I wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. This presentation is live and interactive, so you can ask questions at any time by clicking in the Ask a Question box in the presentation window. A PDF of today's presentation will be available in the Event Resources section directly below the Ask a Question box. If you are running pop-up blocking software, you will need to disable it to view this webcast. In addition, we recommend that you close down all other applications for better performance. For your convenience, this presentation will be available on demand within 24 hours of this live event. A reminder email message will go to all registrants with a link to the archive, and it also will be accessible from the Military and Aerospace Electronics homepage at www.militaryaerospace.com. So, let's get started with Roger Hosking of Pentec. Roger? Thanks, John, and thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Today, we're going to take a look at some of the uh, techniques and, and ideas that John just presented, but um, we're going to cover them at a relatively high level, giving you just an overview of each of these different uh, strategies for uh, software radio development. Um, we're going to let you take a look. If there's more interest, you can always go to our website uh, and, or give us a call and find out more about each of them. So these are the topics that we're going to be covering today, um, as John listed, and we're going to get started with uh, the, some of the first basic problems or challenges that, that all software radio embedded systems engineers face. And you can see this list here should be familiar to, to most of you who, who are doing design, system design, system integration. All of these factors present problems, and all of these problems, of course, can be met with new uh, ideas and new technology, which we'll be covering today. Some of it has to do with new devices. Some of it has to do with faster connects, standards for both hardware and FPGAs, some new tools, both for um, software tools and also for um, uh, block diagram entry, especially for FPGA development. And so what we're going to do is go into, and then the other thing, of course, is open protocols which then can help with um, software radio traffic. So the first thing we're going to take a look at is some of the new device technology, and specifically because we use FPGAs on all of our software radio products, as most, uh, most people do, what we're showing here is a graph that shows the families from Xilinx of the Vertex 4, 5, 6, 7, and then the uh, successor, the, the UltraScale family, and you can see on the vertical axis the number of logic cells in uh, roughly the same size package. So what this, what this graph shows is a dramatic increase in terms of density of how many resources you have going forward in the same footprint based on just new silicon technology. If we compare uh, uh, the last three families uh, of Xilinx FPGAs, on a bar graph where we have a, a relative 100% uh, over at the uh, far right and 0% on the far left, 
what you can see, <coughs> excuse me, is in the logic cells, you can see the blue represents vertex 6, the uh, yellow represents vertex 7, and the green is the Kintex ultrascale. These are the, the uh, largest members of those families for logic cells. Uh, these are DSP slices, which is a major resource for software radio, uh, the speed of uh, connected SD RAM, the number of uh, bits of block RAM inside the FPGA, and then the number of configurable logic blocks. So what you see from these bars is a dramatic increase in all of these resources that, that we've uh, illustrated here. Uh, each time another evolutionary step takes place in the Xilinx FPGA uh, family. But at the same time, there's some things that get smaller, and those are power dissipation factors. So the relative I.O. power, this is the power that it takes to drive an I.O. pin. You can see <coughs> that the Vertex 6 is now um, normalized to 100%, and the Kintex Ultrascale is down at a 56% of the power relative to the Vertex 6. Likewise, we can go to dynamic power. This is the switching power. And then the static power. This has to do with the leakage that's in the silicon that takes place whether you're switching or not. So you can see more resources and far less uh, power dissipation uh, per resource going uh, on these slides here. It gives you a, a nice uh, overview of, of what's inside of, of each of these families. We have used these families extensively on our software radio products. The latest one is called Jade. This is an XMC module, uh, the most popular mezzanine standard in the embedded system industry, and it's an open standard. We are using um, the uh, same form factor for the previous three generations, which include our Cobalt Vertex 6, Onyx Vertex 7, and then the new uh, Jade Kintex Ultrascale. And you can see a range of resources from the, the uh, smallest Vertex 6 up to the largest Kintex Ultrascale by more than a factor of 10 in terms of size and capacity. This lets our customers choose the appropriate FPGAs to get the resources that they need for a particular application. But another benefit of the Kintex Ultrascale is, the, as we've seen, the reduction in power and the cost per logic cell. The cost is uh, dramatically lower, as much as 50% less than the previous families, and power dissipation overall is down uh, typically 30 to 40%. The other thing that we do in our um, strategy of putting products uh, out into the market is we install a lot of built-in factory features in the FPGAs so that when you get the product, you will get, for example, acquisition engines built into the F FPGAs for doing radar range gate uh, acquisition or triggering and so forth. We also do multiband digital down converters, a very, very basic operation that's required in virtually all software radio. Uh, power meters to detect energy. This is important for scanning and monitoring signals. Metadata generators for doing time stamping of the data and linked list DMA controllers to help you move the data from the FPGA through the XMC connectors out to the rest of your system. These are all part of the standard delivered product and, and kind of the way that we deliver products to our customers. One of the other things that's changed uh, in the uh, recent few years is the fact that um, things are moving from LVDS data converter interfaces for D to A converters, A to D converters, that which pr previously were pretty much all done with parallel LVDS logic. It's a very simple interface. You basically get one clock for each word of data that comes across from the device into the FPGA. The nice advantage here is it's simple. It's very easy to change the sampling rate independent of what's inside the FPGA. The problem is that it takes a lot of pins, and it takes a lot of traces and space on the board. So um, what we do is then, in a, in a very high-speed data converter, we have a problem in that it takes a tremendous number of pins. So here, for example, we have a Texas Instruments part that runs at 3.6 gigahertz. It requires 48 LVDS pairs, which means 96 printed circuit board traces between the data converter 
and the FPGA because the data has been demultiplexed just to, to maintain a, a reasonable rate into the FPGA. So you can see that those traces take up a lot of space. And the aggregate rate here we're getting is about 5.4 gigabytes per second between the data converter and the FPGA. So in order to solve some of these issues, a new interface called JESD 204B uh, is, is offered and standardized in the market. What it does is it replaces the parallel LBDS lines with gigabit serial links that can run up to 12.5 gigabaud today. It allows you to move data uh, at very high rates over fewer traces than the um, uh, highly parallel structure we looked at before. So it gives you a lot more capability in, in smaller space, less copper uh, on your printed circuit board. So here, for example, you could, you could see that a 3 gigahertz 14-bit A to D, not that much different from the previous A to D, um, which has, a, in this case, 5.25 gigabytes per second, only requires four gigabit serial link pairs, or eight traces, as compared with the uh, 96 traces that we looked at on the previous example. However, the disadvantage is that you have a lot of different modes in these new A to D converters. Each one uh, has a different framing pattern that can then change as you change mode. And what the consequence is, is that the FPGA um, has to accommodate each of those different framing patterns. The other thing is, as you change the sample clock rate in the data converter, you also have to change the clock rate on the gigabit serial transceiver uh, clock transceivers in the FPGA, and that is inconvenient. So COTS vendors must abstract all of these complexities from the users, and that's what we do in our products. We make the A to D converter look like the same parallel interface in the previous ones by absorbing these complexities and providing for all of the different changes that are required for frequency change and for uh, mode change within the data converter itself. Another major uh, advantage that, that's, that's creeping into a lot of um, embedded systems now is the optical backplane defined in VITA 66.4. Here you see a VPX module. This is a VPX, which is another um, standard of VITA 65, uh, which is shown at the top with its backplane connector. And you see a mating um, a VPX backplane uh, on the uh, bottom of the diagram, these two mate together. And what the Vita 66.4 does is it replaces half of the P2 connector and the upper connector that you see there with a um, metal housing that supports the MT optical ferrule so that inside of this is a floating ferrule that contains uh, optical lanes. There's a matching connector on the back plane with alignment pins that um, has a similar mating optical ferrule inside so that when the board is plugged into the back plane, the ends of the optical pipes that are presented in each of those ferrules connect together and bridge the gap across from the, the module, which is on top, into the back plane. The nice thing about Vita 66.4, it really does not define any particular protocol. So it can support many, many different popular protocols it gives you the ability to connect uh, between two modules within a chassis, and it also allows you to, ch to connect between chassis. So this standard was approved last year in May, about a year ago, uh, and it's being used now um, quite extensively uh, in the, in the uh, industry now. So one of the nice things that it can do, as I mentioned, to go between two boards, if you have two Vita 66 chassis, you can connect one board to the other in a link that's optical, completely independent of the uh, uh, PCI Express link that's usually part of these boards. But you can also go to a bulkhead connector that's located on, say, the back of the chassis and connect a very high-speed signal stream up to, a, let's say, another chassis or to a remote acquisition system. This is becoming increasingly popular for bringing digitized data across optical links to these subsystems. The advantages, uh, of course, are that you get extremely high data rates, so you can 
support wideband sensors. It radiates, the optical cable radiates no EMI, and it's completely immune to EMI radiation, so it has no susceptibility. And you can go over hundreds of meters or even kilometers to, um, between the two links. Optical cable is much smaller and lighter than copper, so that makes it easier to install, and also it makes it um, actually less expensive. Another standard, and this has to do with FPGA technology, is called AXI-4. This is a standard that, was, that evolved from the ARM um, uh, architecture. And what it does is, is it defines a method of connecting blocks between, um, um, functional blocks between system-on-chip designs. It was first introduced <coughs> in 2010 but it's being used now for IP and for connecting uh, blocks between different uh, functions within an FPGA. And now this is being used by Xilinx and also by Altera for the interconnection of IP blocks for on-chip processors and peripherals and also between blocks within an FPGA. The nice thing about the AXE4 is it really handles the housekeeping. It's like um, if you have different data widths or if you have different speeds, the AXI4 interface can be used with a suitable design tool to accommodate those different speeds without having the uh, engineer having to build a special gasket between uh, one block and another block. It also allows you to, to ease the integration of um, different IP from different third parties or different um, you know, custom blocks that you actually create yourself so that if you use the standard, they all can be interconnected very easily using AXI4. We provide a lot of IP uh, in our FPGA design kit, which we call Navigator. This is provided as a collection of AXI4 compliant IP blocks. You can see a list of them here. They're all named appropriately for the function, and each of them can be used as part of the fabric of the FPGA design. These are the graphical representation of those blocks, the, the AXI4 blocks, that's presented in the Xilinx Vivado IP integrator screen. You can see each of those blocks, like we have a DDC over at the left, we have a power meter. Each of those blocks represents a AXI4 structure, and the connections that you see here are done with these AXI4 compliant links. If you go back to designing with the older, just VHDL, this is the screen that you have to work with, and it's not extremely user-friendly. If you know VHDL, you can read this and you can wade through it and get the job done. But the nice thing about the new graphical design tools like the Xilinx Vivado IP integrator is that you, you, this is your workspace. So what you do is you can pull in different modules from the libraries, each of them AXI4 compliant. And for example, this is a block uh, from Pentec. This is an, uh, a Pentec supplied AXI4 block. This is a, a block from Xilinx. What you can do to connect the one block to another is you click on the output of one block, drag your mouse over, click onto the input block, uh, input port of another block, and what IP Integrator does is it automatically creates the, the link, the AXI4 link from one block to another, takes care of the data width and the data, the clock speeds if they're different between them, and automatically does the handshaking, the clocking, the control signals, um, all of that is done within the AXI4 link through IP Integrator. Now, to support the um, IP blocks that we just looked at, we're offering a IP uh, board support package, which is called Navigator Board Support Package. What it does is it gives you the ability to link, a one -to have a one-to-one -one relationship between each of the modules 
that are in the IP blocks over in the FPGA to a corresponding control block that's in the uh, Navigator board support package. The nice thing about this is that people are going to change functions in the FPGA block. So in order to accommodate that change, what you need to do is go back to the board support package, which contains the C programming module that controls that block, and maybe uh, add a new structure, a new function, a new call, a new parameter that then takes advantage of, of, uh, of, of that same um, architecture, but now supports the new functions that you've added in the IP. So the whole thing here is to allow you to add, modify, create new modules in the FPGA and then have a correspondingly um, um, uh, have, a, have an easy path to do the software support package that's over in the board support package creating new modules or changed modules uh, over there that correspond to whatever changes are made in the design kit in the FPGA so together uh, this design suite the board support package and the FPGA design kit are called navigator and they come together as part of a uh, support package for each of the boards. Now there's another new um, protocol that's been uh, developed over the last several years. Actually, it started in, uh, as early as 2005 called VITA 49. And as you know, VITA is the uh, standards organization for embedded systems. The whole issue, the rationale and the methodology for VITA 49 was that traditional software radios used what, what's called stovepipe architectures. And the trouble is that every single system used a dedicated link, both for the analog signals, which you can see in red, uh, switching signals, uh, cabling, and so forth, um, that was very specific to a particular type of radio. The Vita 49, or as it's called, the VRT, replaces a lot of those analog links by first digitizing them up close to the uh, RF signal and then using a digital network to distribute those digitized I, uh, IF or RF signals to the signal processing blocks. What this means is that the radio can be reconfigured rather easily through software just by routing the packets that come from the digital um, uh, front end to the appropriate signal processing resources that are further downstream. So you can see the blue links here uh, really represent the VRT enabled digital links. And the VRT again is, is the nickname for the Vita 49 radio transport protocol. These links include um, metadata, control, timestamping, and so forth. So let's take a look a little closer at what's in Vita 49. Here we see a receiver system, a processor system, and a transmitter system. What we have is we have a definition then within the receiver to create signal data packets that contain digitized IF and RF signals, as well as baseband signals. But they also contain information about those signals that can then be sent directly to the processing where the timestamp and the signal identification that goes along with it can be used to uh, process the signal knowing what frequency and bandwidth it was. You can also use signal packets for transmit going from the processor out to a transmitter, uh, BRT transmitter system. The timestamp here can then be used to precisely tell the transmitter exactly what time to transmit the signal. Now, other types of packets that are defined in Vita 49 include context packets. And what these do is the, they report the complete operational state of the receiver, the uh, sample rate, the bandwidth, frequency, uh, antenna angle, GPS coordinates, so that this can be then used in addition to the timestamp signal packets to get a context for how that signal was received, where it was received, what angle the antenna was at when it was received. We also can receive context packets coming back from the transmitter 
to confirm that its operation is as it should be, that its power levels uh, are what they should be, that the bandwidth is what it should be. So again, what it does is it gives the uh, processing and control system a complete status of what's going on in the transmitter as well as getting the information from the receiver. We also have added, and this is in the Vita 49.2, which is the latest version of the specification uh, that's currently under draft and being voted on right now, control packets allows the processing and control system to control all of the parameters in the receiver and also all of the parameters within the transmitter. So these packets then are, are sent to completely uh, control the equipment using the same fields as the context packets that were, uh, we talked about in the last slide. And after the control packet is sent, you get an acknowledge context packet back to the control system from both the receiver and the transmitter telling you that the the command was, uh, the control was received and it's executed or that there was a problem in executing the command. So these um, um, co control packets and, and the uh, acknowledge packets can really be used to put the processing and control system in charge, not only of the signals, but all, also all of the operational modes of the particular software radio. And this standard is now being um, uh, as I said, voted on. It's um, being used extensively for government-based um, receivers and uh, software radio systems. And here's just an example of what the kind of targeting uh, of, of these systems is, is designed for. Here, imagine that you have four different receivers, uh, 49.2, Vita 49.2 receivers, and imagine you have a diverse group of users. These could be analysts. They could be troops in the field. They could be command and control centers. It, it could be a headquarters, a base, a military base. Each of those users has different needs in terms of what information, where, where the information has to come from, and making different decisions and doing different analysis. So to support those um, different users, we have a VRT link joining each of the four receivers through a radio resource controller or gateway. This is like a switch or a switchboard. They can then route the traffic from the receivers through VRT links over to the users. Each user can, can request different uh, signals from different receivers with different bandwidths, with different uh, characteristics, different signal frequencies, and so forth. And with the control structure, you know, each of these users has the ability to ask for new things or changes to the signals that he's getting. So uh, the whole idea here is to, to have a very flexible method of sharing common software radio hardware at the front end to support a lot of different users and applications at the user level. You can see that Vita 49 has some obvious advantages. It really standardizes the protocol. All of these types of signals, the digitized signals, were previously sent from point A to point B using some protocol, and each one tended to be proprietary in the past. So this is a way of standardizing that so that it can be used across multiple vendors and across multiple platforms. Uh, it's very scalable. It's very flexible. You can get some very high precision time stamping. And the whole idea of the time stamping is it has to be precise enough to support some time and phase critical applications like beam forming, phased array antennas, uh, TDOA, um, precise um, recording, and so forth. The other thing it can be used for is uh, very wideband signals because um, these um, these signals that, that are digitized now on these links, the links, of course, can be extremely fast. They can be optical links, as we've seen before, to support some of the fastest and the widest bandwidth signals that need to go for radar communications and countermeasures. So we're going to see a lot more of the Vita 49 being a flow-down requirement from the government uh, to vendors who are providing software radio equipment uh, to the government and to the military.
Here's an example of one of our jade boards based on the Kintex UltraScale. This is a block diagram showing uh, basically all of the uh, major blocks uh, with eight 16-bit A to D converters. Uh, we have multiband digital down converters, again, installed in the FPGA, um, DDR4 memory, the Vita 66 optical interface is an option on a carrier that we have. We have very fast PCI Express, built-in clock synthesizer, and also optional Vita 49 radio transport protocol. So this kind of um, summarizes all of the different aspects of the technologies that we talked about before and gives you an example of a product that, contain, that uh, contains them. So uh, just to summarize what we've talked about so far, we've talked about some new device technology, specifically the new Kintex UltraScale FPGA. We talked about faster interconnects, the JESD 204B, open hardware standards like the Vita 66.4 optical backplane, open FPGA standards, the Axie 4 IP interconnects, graphically oriented design tools like the Xilinx Vivado IP integrator with our Navigator uh, FPGA design kit using that the Axie 4 standard, high level software tools. Uh, for uh, the navigator using the uh, board support package, open protocol standards using the Vita 49 radio transport protocol was the last thing we looked at. So these are these are the um, uh, specific uh, pieces of technology that we looked at today, and uh, this is really the uh, the last slide in the presentation. So now um, we're going to like to open it up for any questions, any specific questions that you might have, and I'll turn it back to you, John. Okay, thank you, Roger. Um, so now it's time for questions and answers from our online audience. As a reminder, you can submit questions at any time by clicking on the Ask a Question box in the presentation window and submitting your question that way. And we've already got a few, which we thank you for. Roger, the first question from our audience is, what is the tuning bandwidth and power available in the VRT transmitter? Uh, as a as a software defined radio, is that a is that clear? Yes, it is. Um, thanks for the question. We um, in the Vita forty nine protocol, there are no uh, absolute limits on any of the parameters. These parameters are um, are uh, extremely flexible in terms of their range, uh, and there's also a lot of, uh, of of new parameters that are being added all the time. So the, to answer your question, Vita 49 itself does not limit the tuning bandwidth. It does not limit the power available. Uh, that is up to the implementation uh, of the uh, designer of the system. And if, uh, for example, you are, um, uh, you're able to send over a control packet whose power level or tuning frequency is outside the range supported by the transmitter, the, the acknowledge packet that comes back will give you an error and say you have exceeded the, the, the power level or you have gone outside the range of the tuning frequency so that you know that that's the case. In that case, what you'd have to have is a different design for the transmitter, a different, a, a different device. But Vita 49 uh, does not limit uh, the power levels or the frequencies or, or basically any other parameter that you, that you have. Okay, we've got a question that concerns uh, uh, something that everybody's thinking about, which is thermal management. Do the ultra-scale FPGAs run cooler than the Vertex 6 or the Vertex 7 FPGAs, or what's the, what's the thermal management picture there? Okay, uh, good question. Those um, thermal, uh, the um, power dissipation uh, uh, specs that we talked about earlier apply to each resource. So um, the issue here is that even though that the power level per resource has gone down, you've got more resources. So what tends to happen is that the power dissipation in a given package, when people start using all the resources, is going to, become, is going to come back to about where it was in the previous generation. The benefit you can get is if you have a given fixed 
application in the FPGA and migrate that only to the new FPGA, perhaps using only half of the new FPGA where you used 100% of the previous, then you will be see seeing a significant decrease in the power dissipation of that new design. If you're not greedy and 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 uh, and, and uh, don't use the rest of the unused resources, you will see that power savings. What people tend to do, though, is they say, "Well, gee, I've got all this extra resource. I'm going to put two of those cores in this new FPGA because they'll fit," and then the power level tends to go back up. Ultimately, the thermal management tends to be a limitation imposed by the package of the device and the junction to case temperature uh, uh, thermal resistance is, is the limiting factor. OK. Um, are, are these devices able to process 5G signals? And if not, when would you expect um, the avail availability of, uh, of, of devices that, that can handle those kinds of signals? OK, yes, uh, we are. Um, selling some product into people who are doing uh, 5G development. Um, the, bandwidth, the maximum bandwidth that, that we can support currently in our product line uh, is uh, a frequency uh, bandwidth up to about uh, 1,500 megahertz, which well exceeds any uh, 5G bandwidth. So we can digitize those signals, and we can also generate signals uh, with uh, a very wide, you know, multi-gigahertz bandwidth as well. So um, that again is 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 um, well within the, our our capabilities are well within what's required for 5G. So the answer is yes, we do have that available today. Okay. Um, all right. Good. Um, so do the do the JSD uh, 204B devices require any additional software development effort? Uh, no, that's that's one of the nice things about that is the is the JSD 204B uh, complexities. Let's put it that way are taken care of by the uh, FPGA design that that we deliver installed at the factory, so that when the customer gets the uh, the product, he is able to use those uh, features without even knowing that there's a JSD interface involved. And that, and that's one of the one of the points I made is you. We need what any vendor should do is abstract those JSD 204B complexities so that the user is is um, is isolated from having to deal with them. So, and that that's true both of software and for the FPGA design kit, where we'll have a module that will handle uh, those functions that the user can interface to, rather than ha have to deal with uh, the complexity of, of those serial uh, interfaces. Uh, right to the FP to the uh, data converter. Okay, Roger, I you you showed a slide about the uh, uh, about the Vita sixty six point four. Uh, what do you see as the rate of adoption uh, for optical backplane technology along this this type of standard? Is there detectable reluctance among your customers uh, uh, to more to moving from copper to um, to fiber, and how do you see that evolving in the future? You know what we're what we're seeing it. We're seeing it primarily for customers who want to have um, primarily distributed uh, systems, where they are uh, either having remote sensors that need to be connected. For for example, aboard a ship, you might have uh, these remote sensors located up on an antenna mast, and then have to bring the digitized signals down. Uh, through the antenna mast, uh, or even in previous uh, versions, bring analog RF signals down through coaxial cables for you know a couple hundred meters or or, or so. Uh, those systems are now being replaced with systems that are using optical links, where the digitizing is done up in the, on the mast, and there's no degradation of signal uh, going from the mast down to the control room. So we see that as, as, the, as some of the first uh, adopters of this. Um, and and I, again, you'll also see it in cases where there could be a large uh, installation where, you, let's say, you might have a, a, a series of, um, like an antenna farm, for example, on, on a ground, you know, a, a field that's covered with antennas. 
uh, phased array antennas where each of those uh, antennas need to be connected from its doghouse over to a central computer. And again, sending over RF from each of those uh, field locations back to a central processor uh, is, is uh, you know, fraught with problems with the RF cable. Optical cables are much easier. So it, it is being adopted. Um, the, if you don't need uh, the benefits of optical, which are primarily lightweight, distance, uh, and speed, then the chances are that people will use more conventional copper or electrical interfaces. But I mentioned the lightweight, and that is particularly important for um, aircraft and at UAVs, where every single ounce uh, has a price on it. And uh, if you can replace a copper cable with an optical cable uh, in a weight-sensitive airborne application, that alone could justify the switch to using the optical links. Okay, just uh, just a note to our online audience. We've had a couple of questions about uh, if there's a way to get a copy of the presentation, and the answer is yes. Um, a PDF of today's presentation will be available in the event resources section um, on this page directly below the ask a question, uh, directly below an Ask the question box. So I just wanted to make that I just wanted to make that clear, and um, you know, don't feel bad about asking that question because you know it's something that a lot of people want to know. Um, so Roger, if you have an existing IP block, do I have to convert it to Axie four before it will work in navig in the Navigator FPGA design kit? Uh, we do have customers who, who have had, um, you know, their special pet algorithm all developed in IP. And one of the things that, that those customers can do is put a wrapper, an Axie 4 wrapper, around that block. And that's relatively easy to do. Uh, and this way, the interface to that block is then um, looks, so the block looks like an Axie 4 block, even though inside it's actually the original block that the customer developed. Another, another technique would be is if you really want to have that block be ultimately configurable or, or adaptable, let's say, to a new design, you might go through the effort, if it's worth it, to convert every inside part of that block to true Axie 4 so that it then can be um, managed uh, as an Axie 4, a true Axie 4 logic from, from top to bottom, inside and out. But a lot of customers don't need or want to go through that uh, redesign, and so they just put the Axie 4 wrapper. And then it'll drop in and uh, be completely supported with the Navigator FPGA design kit and the Xilinx Vivado IP integrator, integrator tool suite. Okay, Roger. I had a during the presentation. I had uh, I had a question in mind, and it it concerns you know the standard versus custom uh, question that people thinking about are thinking about from time to time. Yeah, and you've got a lot of different customers who have very demanding requirements. And how far does standard um, how how far does standard software defined radio and embedded computing uh, uh, take you in meeting all of your customer requirements? Are there are there cases now and then when you can when you have to depart from standard architectures and and rely on custom designs? Is that is that a relevant question these days? I would say that what we provide to customers is a more of a, more or less of a standard development environment that contains all of the arms and legs in terms of getting the signals uh, into the FPGA or into your system, connecting up high-speed acquisition links to system memory and so forth. Uh, then, uh, you know, since everybody's doing something different, it's uh, true that about 80% of our customers will buy the FPGA design kit to add their own special algorithm, let's say it's a decoding or decryption algorithm inside the FPGA, and that is something that, that the customer will add, kind of like his own magic sauce and his own specialty in terms of adding value uh, to the system to make it that system his product and to make uh, his IP the, the major value add for his customer.
So um, we we have um, been supporting customers, you know, now for 30 years who are doing essentially that kind of thing, adding their own uh, either software or their own FPGA uh, IP uh, to get a particular unique first of a kind uh, configuration to meet a, a new application, a new challenge, a new statement of work that's coming from their customer. Okay, it sounds like it's kind of the best of both worlds. Um, yep. So um, for our online audience, um, we're getting toward the end of our questions. I wanted to urge you, we still, we, we still have a few minutes left if you would like to ask a question. Um, you, certainly, you, you certainly can do that. Um, if if uh you know you can just you know click on the ask question uh button and submit your question so um i have a question here it's what is the current approval status of vita 49 roger okay vita 49 had been approved previously um uh at at level 0 and uh that, that took place about uh 6 years ago or so and since then, uh, the Vita 49.2 uh, enhancement, which adds the new structures that we talked about today, which includes the new context packets, the new control packets, the new acknowledge packets, uh, all of those, those new features that we talked about today are now being reviewed and approved uh, by the uh, Vita 49 uh, working group. And we expect to have uh, that ratified uh, sometime before, let's say, the end of June. So uh, there's been a lot of work. The nice thing about the Vita 49 working group, it, it consists of members of the community from uh, the government, from the military, from universities, uh, and from vendors uh, like ourselves, like Pentech, uh, who are all contributing their part to it so that, uh, you know, it's not something that's coming out of an ivory tower. It's something that's coming from a group of users and a group of vendors and a group of scientists who are all putting their best effort into making this as uh, as powerful and useful as possible. Okay, well, I see that we've come to the end of our list of questions. Oh, no, I see one here. Um, Roger, is the code within the Axie 4 modules completely abstracted away from the user? Uh, no. In fact, you can build... Uh, if, if, you're, if you're creating your own Axie 4 module, you can um, uh, uh, create it uh, w without any restriction of access to the very lowest level uh, within the module so that a customer could go in, drill down, and get to the very lowest level, the, the very lowest FPGA uh, VHDL structure within it. So primarily, uh, and, and on the other hand, you could also protect uh, you know certain portions of the uh, of the design within the axi4 module if you need to or want to restrict it so it can be done either way primarily what axi4 does is it is is it it's the IO or the interface connection that's the critical part and what's inside the axi4 module uh, can be also additional axi4 modules that are you know connected up inside and then a super axi4 module created from that collection or it can be just VHDL the key though is that its interface to to the outside world uh, however it's done is is axi4 the other nice thing about axi4 is that it um, if you do it in a, in a in a recommended consistent way with the way Xilinx and Altera and Pentech do it uh, simply clicking on that block in the graphical design tool will automatically open up all the uh, documentation for that block to tell you exactly how to use it, what the input-output parameters are, uh, and what its function is. So it, it makes a very efficient way for designers to find out and figure out what a block's going to do uh, as he's doing the design. Okay. Um, <clears throat> it's, here's a question. I'm interested in free to affordable FPGA training, can you provide any links or information from uh, for Los Angeles, California opportunities uh, for, for a person who's still looking for a job? Roger, any advice there? Yeah, what we always do is um, uh, Xilinx does has some very very good training, 
And so uh, if you're new to FPGA design, you can get a kind of a, a starter seminar uh, from Xilinx that could last three, four, five days, depending on the, the uh, course that you choose. Uh, all of our FPGA uh, customers um, are um, either have the experience that they need or they will acquire that experience by going to uh, training uh, at one of the Xilinx uh, seminars. And they, they do have advanced classes uh, as well for uh, going into more detail and higher level uh, design activities. Uh, but all of it is now focused and centered around the use of the Vivado tool suite, which is their latest tool suite. And it includes the IP integrator uh, that we talked about. So I would, short answer, I would contact uh, Xilinx uh, to, uh, to find out about what, what the next training cycle is in their seminar series. Okay. Well, Roger, I mean, I don't I don't have another question in the queue right now. Is there based on everything that we've covered today and all the questions that have been asked, is there anything that I or the audience has forgotten to ask you that's a particularly crucial point? Um, gee, I think we've covered most of it, John. Um, and and I guess the the point is that uh I there an email uh to me, uh I'd be glad to answer. Uh, if you want to give me a call or an email, you go to our website. Uh, you can look at our uh, Jade Navigator video, which is a really nice four-and-a-half-minute video that's right on our home page that goes through uh, the, this new Jade architecture and the Navigator tools that we've uh, talked about today. Uh, but please feel free to contact me or info at pentech.com. Uh, you can go to our website, um, request a quote. Uh, we've got a lot of resources there. So I would say that if, um, if you have any questions or requirements, we're here to help you, and we will definitely recommend the most appropriate solution uh, to, to the problem that you present to us. All right. Well, I think that's, uh, that's, that's our presentation for today. So on behalf of Military and Aerospace Electronics and Penwell, I would like to thank today's speaker, Roger Hosking, and our sponsors, Pentech and National Instruments, for today's presentation on new technologies that transform software radio architectures. Once again, this presentation will be archived within 24 hours and can be accessed from our homepage at www.militaryaerospace.com. A reminder email message will go out to all registrants, complete with a direct link to the archive. So we thank you for joining us today. I'm John Keller, Chief Editor of Military and Aerospace Electronics.